Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to speak to you today as a banker. I'm one of the few private sector people who've spoken today. I'm an alumnus of a number of the multilaterals, most recently the African Development Bank. So the examples I'm going to drive to pretty quickly are African examples. And to be very clear, when we talk about low-income jurisdictions, I don't mean middle-income countries like Morocco um, or Colombia um, or India. I'm talking about what's referred to from the banker side as real frontier markets. And so that's why the African examples, I think, are helpful. Um, Neil also set down the standard this shouldn't be a polite, friendly conversation. So as you'll see, what I'm going to describe to you is hard to do. It's hard to do in terms of getting large institutional investors into these markets. And I'm not talking also in the way Chris talked about some of the small equity transactions. These are trying to do in frontier markets what institutional investors do in Chicago, in the solar, the big solar plants in Arizona, or in the airports in the UK. Institutional investors, insurance companies, and pension funds do that work, not banks. They don't do it in emerging markets. And that's the question is, how do we do, as Neil characterized it, the financial engineering to actually get this stuff done? Now, I'm going to go back over a number of themes people have already touched on, but it's just a reminder um, of why this stuff doesn't happen. So a number of the colleagues have talked about on the green side, as you see, um, why is this now, why is an inclination for institutional investors even to have the conversation about going to Africa or to the weaker parts of Southeast Asia and the Caribbean, for example? People are well aware of the interest rate regime, the difficulty of making return. Asset managers, in particular, are getting hammered by, of course, all the passive funds, the ETFs. So actually, the new active asset management is justifying the paying of fees to go into more specialized, more interesting niche sectors so they can make money. That also leads equally to a sense of looking for new uncorrelated assets, too much liquidity, everything trades at the same level. Where do you get something that's different in some of the markets that we're discussing? Finally, colleagues have talked about in great detail, of course, the interest from the providers of the liquidity, the savers, the new generation, people looking for sustainable and responsible investments. Colleagues have mentioned equally, so what does this lead to? A big push into a number of asset classes listed on the bottom left, which allow us to drive into some of the sectors we're about to talk to. Um, impact investing, private debt. ESG infrastructure and sustainable natural resources, agriculture, for example. Now, why doesn't this happen? Um, there's been a characterization throughout the past day and a half that somehow there's an information problem. And it's true that there's a perception risk rather than what may be the actual loss given default or recovery rates. But I'll focus in on the second point there. Um, which is reputation risk, and I think it's understated. And as I'll talk about in the two transactions that we'll review in detail, um, big institutional investors in part don't go to Africa because they don't want to have the news impact of having activities where they're invested or even the countries where they're invested suddenly hitting the news in the manner of a Mozambique event. It's not the loss of the money even. It's getting associated with something that's unpleasant and inappropriate. The bottom two points are important here. Investment mandates are risk averse and capital treatment, certainly in Europe with the arrival of Solvency II for insurance companies. And it's important when I will talk a lot about risk mitigation. Big institutional investors do not have mandates to take emerging market risk. And I mean even 1%. Not only because the mandates don't allow them to do that, people to give them the money to manage, but indeed the capital treatment. If you have 5% exposure to the Cote d'Ivoire, suddenly the entire return profile flies out the window. So what I'm going to talk to you about is full risk transfer in these, in these structures. Because as the point is made there on the lower, the lower right, based on World Bank estimates, institutional investors do not take part in real emerging market infrastructure today. Now, just as a reminder, this is a nice Moody slide I use often, which it just makes the point that have been made by several colleagues previously, including in Mark's presentation. Um, if you look at advanced economies, look at big project finance, what is, the, what is the cause of default? Unsurprisingly, it's market risk. Toll roads, solar plants, you don't produce, people don't pay. It's real merchant risk. Emerging markets, as people are well aware, what's the big bar? Second from the bottom, country risk in all of its manifestations. Now, 
Now we're going to get into some of the nuts and bolts of what exactly are we talking about in terms of risk transfer. Some of this has been discussed by colleagues, and I'll help deconstruct the, the chart a little bit. There are two different classes of this kind of activity, how institutional investors get involved. Number one, the IFC, Neil mentioned early on, the asset management company in which big institutional investors, big insurance companies in Europe that are partners of the IFC in this program, they co-invest. They benefit from the halo, the experience, but I would argue most importantly, the World Bank Group's preferred creditor treatment was mentioned by Mark also as well. So what does that mean? Simply put, people don't default, except for the examples given, on the World Bank. It's sort of an amorphous category, but it gives people confidence to invest. Uh, notwithstanding the IFC's rightful pride in these activities, it's a small thing. I would also argue, and this is where I'm saying it's hard as a private banker, it's hard to get big institutional investors in because a lot of the projects that are relatively easy, and I'm, I have to say it this way in Africa, to do, the DFIs are there. So what I have to do is try to define a different category of activity for getting institutional investors in via direct trades that we'll discuss. Now, there are a range of risk mitigation instruments. First of all, I think Kruskaya talked about some of the guarantee products that the World Bank has and the IFC and other multilaterals. Very powerful. They take the risk away. So it's extremely potent and extremely helpful when you're building these transactions. Then you have a whole sliding scale that runs all the way over to the commercial insurance area. This is the really the direction where a lot of our thinking has to go, how to blend the multilaterals with the people that really take risk in the market, that know how to take risk, which is the insurance and reinsurance markets. And we come up to the very beginning, um, which for me is a, a guiding line for how we're supposed to think about this kind of activity. Professor Rajan, by the way, is a member of this G20 eminent persons group. If you haven't seen the report, you should read it. It provides a lot of interesting thinking. And among the conclusions of the first two points put up at the front, reorienting the multilateral development bank business model so they are not lending as much. I work for the biggest bank in Japan. I have an enormous balance sheet. The insurance companies and pension funds I work with have even more cash. They don't have risk tolerance. So the multilaterals, back to why I was prodding Mark earlier in the conversation, they need to take more risk. And we can provide the liquidity. Equally, they talk about diversifying risk in the system, so the multilaterals indeed are not taking it, and they don't have to go ask the shareholders. They go into the insurance market and go find the political risk cover. So let me step, I'm going to step, I'm moving quickly, and I apologize for time limits. I'm going to go into two transactions, one of which was executed um, about seven months ago, and the next one is a live trade, uh, which is sort of masked to allow me to talk about it. Now, this is a transaction for the Republic of, of the Cote d'Ivoire. It was concluded, as I say, about six months ago. What the trade tries to do is to finance in the market, not directly through either a bank or a multilateral, um, a slice of the social infrastructure budget for the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire. Now, in simple terms, if you, have, you have a loan to the Republic of the Cote d'Ivoire. Now, it is repackaged and uh, the colleague was talking yesterday about SPVs and registration and tax havens. Indeed, we are talking about one of those. This is a Luxembourg-based SPV. It takes the loan and issues a note, a bond, to investors. These are big insurance companies and big pension funds who buy the bond. Sounds straightforward enough. Now, as I've said, they are not going to buy the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire. So what we do is we work with one of the multilaterals in Africa. This is Africa Trade Insurance Agency. It's a little baby entity like MIGA, works only in Africa. The Africa Tr African Development Bank is the largest shareholder. They are single A rated, strong, robust entity. They provide 100% of principal and insurance guarantee. Because remember back to the point, the investor cannot take one percentage of pure African risk. So this structure takes that effective non-payment contract. Remember, this is an insurance-style contract. And so what the investor gets through a rating process is a strong investment-grade asset. So that's the alchemy here. We're taking the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire, B1, we're turning it into a high investment-grade note, which is sold to investors. That is hard to do. The rating agencies, and where's S&P? I see Philip there. Um, they have great difficulty understanding exactly the value of the multilateral protection. 
because in fact, and Neil made the comment about the GEMS data, the loss and recovery data, that is in fact not shared very widely, and the rating agencies don't really know what to do with the multi allowable money, so we in the end, we end up over-covering because no one really knows what the preferred creditor treatment means in practicality. Nonetheless, we get 100% cover here, so the investors are able to invest. One last point here is sort of another interesting point about reputation and ESG. This was all done for social infrastructure. The Cote d'Ivoire sent us a spreadsheet with 200 line items with so a combination of little bits of investment in water systems, renewable energy, roads, schools, house. Great, great mixture. The investors said, absolutely not. We cannot look through a spreadsheet with 200 items. Again, it's a question of the, the legitimacy investment. Are you investing in something that's appropriate? So the way to get around this we worked with one of the social bond accreditation agencies, of which there are quite a few, with the rise of the ESG investing phenomenon. So they took about six weeks to provide an overall accreditation to say everything in this list, and we had to toss out things like police housing that looked a little complicated, um, and therefore they blessed it as a social loan. Investors loved it. Insurance company in Japan purchased. It was a miracle. First Japanese institutional investment in Africa, to my knowledge. They loved it. They issued a press report. One of the Northern European pension funds that invested put it in their annual report. So you see how you use tools in the market, both the rating, which is critical, because critical, a public pension fund cannot invest in a security that is not rated. So we had to wrangle with rating agencies to get the rating done had to use the accreditation agencies and make the whole thing safe in a reputation sense. And this is how it's done. Next trade, and this is a live example, but it's really the most important exercise in a way. The one before was the packaging of a Ministry of Finance CapEx program, because it's still the Ministry of Finance that is the, the borrower, they're the risk. Here, this is a project. And in fact, the reality in Africa is you got to have more projects. And this is the point I will say, this is a live exercise. We're not there yet because I am begging the sponsor of the project to allow me to get in because it's too much DFI money. This is a nice project, social infrastructure in a pretty stable country. Everybody wants to do it. Now, they're agreeing for innovation purposes that we'll give it a try. Let me tell you, it's another example of how, the, how risk mitigation really works in practice and what we're trying to do. So this is a big project, so it's about a billion dollars, crudely. Um, and again, you have a project company, this is a big project engineering firm that you will all know, um, and they have a nice big piece of social infrastructure. They have a contract with the government for availability payments. It means if the infrastructure is built and works, and performs as it says on the tin, they will pay. So it's not like a toll road where you have variability, it's pretty straightforward. So um, again, we have an SPV that takes the loan and the objective again is to get it to investors with a rating. Now this is trickier, remember this is new build infrastructure, this is construction in Africa, land displacement of people, everything, it's all there. So we, this is only, they only get the big guns here. This is all AAA up top. And here you have a combination of the World Bank Group, MIGA, which I think as you'll know is the guarantee insurance style entity of the World Bank Group, combined with the African Development Bank. Why are both of them there? Again, I'm trying to do a bond here. I'm trying to get it into the market so the institutional investors can buy it like a bond. The thing about a bond is not only that the payment has to arrive in full and on time every single coupon date, but also there has to be full protection. So MEGA provides political risk insurance. Back to the point here, there's an availability payment the government pays if the infrastructure is in place. If they don't pay, remember this is Africa, if they don't pay, MEGA engages to pay. But MIGA doesn't pay right away. There's an arbitration period, like an insurance company, you have to determine if there's a loss, the volume, whether the, in fact it's covered by policy. It's not a guarantee. It's an insurance product. So if something happens and MIGA engages with the government about why the payment was not made, remember the bond is out there in the market, in theory. So what happens is we have a liquidity facility with the African Development Bank. 
so that during the period, if there's arbitration, if something happens, and there's an arbitration going on to determine indeed whether MIGA is going to pay, the African Development Bank will pay the bond. Let's say at some point in the middle of this period, after six months, a coupon is due to the investors. The African Development Bank pays the coupon. You continue on. Arbitration can take up to three years. Then they pay again, so the bond continues to live. Investors continue to get their money, and most importantly, the rating agencies think it's okay. And this, this is a variant on a transaction that was done previously, and the rating has continued to stand five notches above the sovereign. So the combination of the two AAAs is pretty robust. So this is, as I say, the final closing comment, that even for new build infrastructure in Africa, um, with these risk mitigation tools, you can get big investors, and I assure you we're talking to the very largest institutional investors in the world that do this stuff everywhere, but not in Africa. This is sort of the steps that we need to get to. Thank you very much.